Hi, welcome to this uh, second lecture of the um, improved ECC modules. And during this lecture, I'll focus on electrocardiography and anti arrhythmic drug therapy for the emergency vet. And I will um, discuss this topic uh, using real life examples. So the objectives of this lecture are to discuss with you the indications for ECG and, and discuss ECG recording techniques. And using examples, I will demonstrate standard interpretation and discuss shortly therapeutic options. Um, as you can see a few pictures here of a dog called, called Jimmy. Um, ECG is, is actually quite an old technique and the, uh, the first mammals in, in which ECGs were made, before humans even, was, uh, was in dogs. You can see Jimmy here with his foot in salt baths and the scientists at this demonstration could look at his, at his ECG on a, on a projector screen. So it's important to realize that ECGs like any test, need a good indication to be made, and there are basically three indications for heart rhythm study, which are bradycardia, tachycardia, and irregular irregularity. Bradycardia in a dog means a heart rate less than 60 per minute, or subjectively, if you have a very stressed dog, uh, and the heart rate is clearly lower than expected. For a cat, any heart rate below 120, is considered quite low. Tachycardia um, in dogs depends a lot on the amount of stress, but if it's clearly more than 150, 160, um, one should consider significant stress or a possible possible tachyarrhythmia. In cats, the upper limit of normal is around 240. And lastly, irregular irregularity. Dogs, as we all know, do have sinus arrhythmia, which might be normal, but that's a regular irregularity. Once a dog has an irregular irregularity, um, an ECG is indicated in cats, any irregular heart rate is abnormal in a clinical setting. Ideally, the ECG should be made in, in, in right lateral recumbency, um, as you can see in this dog. Uh, that's not always possible, especially in an emergency setting when an animal might be very dyspneic or in shock, in which case it might be better to do the ECG. For example, a dyspneic animal, if they have significant arrhythmias, to so do the ECG in sternal and standing. But it's important to realize that our reference values um, have been all determined in normal animals in a right lateral recumbency. So if you want a detailed comparison with reference values, it's important to make the ECG in right lateral recumbency. And you can see that the four clips, four electrodes of the standard six lead ECG are placed on the legs. It doesn't really matter where you place the electrodes. Um, you can see that for the hind legs, we we'll use a skinfold cranial to the hook. And for the front legs, we use a skinfold cranial. You can also use caudal of the elbow. You just have to make sure the clips are not over the chest because that would give breathing eye effects. It's seldomly necessary in the clinical setting to make three cordial leads in a third dimension, but sometimes that can be quite helpful to, for example, pick up P waves if you can't see them in the standard leads. Before we're going to discuss ECGs, you need to know the anatomy of the cardiac conduction system, which is depicted in this figure. Normally, the cardiac depolarization waves are starting in the sinus node or sinoatrial node. Basically, every myocyte, every cardiac cell has the ability to spontaneously depolarize, but the cells in the sinus node do depolarize the quickest. They're the most unstable, if you want to say it that way. Um, and therefore, they um, lead the rhythm. They're the pacemaker. So once a depolarization wave starts in the sinus node, the depolarization wave is spreading through both atria, both the right and the left atrium, quite quickly through internodal tracts, so right and towards the left. And then we'll get the depolarization of the atria, followed by 
excitation contraction coupling and contraction of the atria and the depolarization wave can only go from the atria towards the ventricles through one specialized part of the conduction system which is the AV node and the conduction in the AV node is actually quite slow and that's quite good because it allows the atria to contract in still relaxed ventricles. Once the AV node delay has passed, which basically is the PQ uh, PR time, you get a rapid depolarization of the ventricles all the way to the apex and then the depolarization from the apex up to the base, causing depolarization, so excitation of the ventricular myocardium, subsequently followed by contraction of the ventricular myocardium and blood flowing into the major arteries. This is how the ECG, a normal ECG in a dog, would look on paper. You can see this is a clearly irregular heart rate. The RR intervals here are a bit longer than there, and it seems to be phasic. Fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. So this seems to be a respiratory arrhythmia. And in a normal ECG, one should be able to identify the normal complexes of a normal ECG. A P wave, small positive deflection in lead two, followed by a QRS complex. There's a small Q, a large R, which is normal lead two. You don't really see an S here, which is also normal, and then a T wave. And this is repeating itself. It's always good to look at all the six leads. Normally, you will see the largest deflections in lead two because that's parallel to the axis of the heart, as well as relative large deflections in lead three in AVF. Um, so often, it's easiest to look at, look at the lead two for a quick and adequate rhythm analysis. Quite a few things have to be assessed when looking at an ECG in detail. First of all, the quality of registration, which basically means do we know the paper speed? Do we know the sensitivity? Do we know the patient details? Are there no annoying artifacts like breathing movements or leg twitching or um, environmental uh, abnormalities like a 50 hertz artifact? It's quite important to go through this, this step because sometimes the quality of registration is not good and it's better to repeat the ECG straight away than to try to interpret possibly an erroneous ECG. Once you're happy with the quality of registration, it's followed by checking regularity. We already discussed in this ECG, it's clearly irregular. Once there's a more than 10% variation in RR intervals, it's considered irregular. Over here, it's only eight millimeters in between. Over here, it's 12. So this is at least a 50% variation. Again, in dogs, it can be normal, in cats, it's clearly abnormal. Second, you count the frequency. Um, it's easiestly done to count the number of beats in a couple of seconds. Let's say we, you, you count it in about three seconds, and then you multiply it by 20. Or you count it for six seconds, then you multiply it by 10 to get a minute rate for the frequency. And after that, after assessing regularity and frequency, um, the individual parts of the ECG have to be interpreted. First of all, we're going to make sure that all the individual parts are consistently associated with each other. Do we always see a P wave in front of the QRS complex? Do we always see a QRS complex after each P wave? And then looking at the individuals. P wave has a certain height, a certain duration, a V conduction or the PQ time from the beginning of the P to the beginning of the QRS complex. The QRS complex Looking at duration, normally should be very narrow because it's supraventricular uh, depolarization. You get a very quick, rapid depolarization of the ventricles. Height should be highest in lead two, about two millivolt. Configuration, normally in dogs and cats, we'll see a small Q, then a large R in lead two, and possibly a small S. And lastly, we'll look at the hard axis of the QRS complex. Um, normally, the complexes are largest in lead 2 or AVF, which means the hard axis is around 60 to 90 degrees. In cats, there can be a bit more normal variation than in dogs. Then you look at the ST segment, which is basically an assessment of, of this part here. Do we see any slurring or elevation, which might indicate myocardial 
hypoxemia. And lastly, we'll look at the T wave and the QT time. The T wave can, for example, be quite spiked um, with hyperkalemia. So that's a standard classic way of assessing ECGs, looking at each part individually. It's still probably the best way and structural way to interpret ECGs. But in the emergency setting, or in a setting where you have to have a quick assessment, it's also good to classify pattern based on pattern recognition and to ask yourself first when you see an ECG, do I have a problem with impulse formation or a problem with impulse conduction? In general, problems with impulse formation cause tachyarrhythmia, so you get extra impulses. Generally, problems with impulse conduction cause bundle branch blocks, which are basically a coincidental finding, but most importantly, severe bradycardias. So this is a first step in a very quick assessment in the emergency setting. Are we dealing with a tachyarrhythmia or a bradycardia? A problem with impulse formation, extra impulses that are formed, or blocks or impulse conduction problems. With regards to abnormal impulse for Formation, the next step should be to assess where the problem is originating. The three tests, sinus node on top here, the supraventricular area, so anywhere in the atria, plus a V node, or the ventricular area, anywhere below. If impulses, extra impulses are formed in the sinus node, it's basically a sinus tachycardia, which is not an arrhythmia. We will always see P waves, followed by normal QRS complexes. Both are seen, both P waves, normal P waves, and normal QRS complexes. Narrow, positive lead two. If the extra impulse, number second, if the extra impulse is formed in the supraventricular area, so either in the right or left atrium or in the area of the AV node, we will not see normal P waves. They might still be P waves, like negative ones or, um, or spiked ones, but they should not be normal. But because the impulse is in the supraventricular area, the conduction through the ventricles is still normal. So you get normal QRS complexes. So again, supraventricular arrhythmias uh, can be recognized by abnormal or no P waves plus normal QRS complexes. And lastly, if abnormal impulses are formed in the ventricular area, we also do not see P waves or normal P waves, and the QRS complexes are also abnormal. They are often wide and bizarre, because the normal conduction system in the ventricles is not used anymore, so you get slower cell-to-cell -cell, um, depolarization, which causes a wider QRS complex, um, and that wider and bizarre QRS complex is also associated with a T wave, which is opposite to the largest deflection of the QRS. So this is a very quick way of assessing whether we're dealing with sinus tachycardia, a supraventricular tachycardia, or a ventricular tachycardia, or arrhythmia. Okay, so these were the basics of um, ECG interpretation, the classic one, and a more emergency setting one. And I will mainly focus on the emergency setting one in discussing the ECGs. So I have a look at this first ECG, which is of a four-year-old dyspneic Great Dane. I'm not going to discuss the dyspnea. The Great Dane had an ECG made. This is a little bit of an artificial exercise. The first thing you always have to ask yourself, why was this ECG made? So what was the indication? I hope you all agree with me. This dog had a tachyarrhythmia. The heart rhythm is irregular. Over here, there's about a little bit less than 15 millimeters in between, so the heart rate is about 100. And over here, there's only 500, 5 millimeters in between, so the heart rate here is about 300. Overall, this will probably be a rhythm of around 200 beats per minute, so it's quite fast. There's a tachyarrhythmia. And then the next step should be, what's the ECG diagnosis? We know it's a tachyarrhythmia, so it's a problem with impulse formation, extra impulses that are formed. We've got three th tests, sinus tachycardia, a 
form of supraventricular tachycardia or a form of ventricular tachycardia. So to see whether it's a sinus tachycardia, if you look whether the P waves, but the baseline is a lead to shaking. There's no clean P wave. You might say, well, maybe this is the one, or that one, or that one. But it's not consistently repeating itself. Or maybe that's a P wave. But if that's a P wave, why don't we see a P wave here? Or there? Or there in the next complex? So it's quite likely this is not a sinus tachycardia. Another reason would be that sinus tachycardia generally is more regular. Could this be a ventricular rhythm? The QRS complexes are quite narrow. They're about a millimeter wide. So this means the normal ventricular conduction system is used. So this is not a ventricular arrhythmia. So this must be some form of a supraventricular tachyarrhythmia. It's fast. It's irregular. The no P waves and the baseline is basically quite irregular, fibrillating. This is a typical example of a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. Hallmarks, as already discussed, no clear P waves, normal QRS complexes, tachycardia, arrhythmia. The base of atrial fibrillation is you have all kinds of microcircuits in the atria that are ca causing a constant irregular depolarization of both atria, the atrial fibrillation, and all those impulses are bombarding the AV node, which luckily quite a bit of the time is in the refractory period, but once it gets out of the ref refractory period, it ca it's getting bombarded sometimes very quickly, sometimes a bit later, and you get an irregular ventricular depolarization. Causes of atrial fibrillation, there are many. They include nervous system imbalance, um, abnormalities of the atrial wall, like atrial fibrosis, but the most important one clinically is atrial enlargement. And this x-ray, for example, can see an animal with a massive left atrial enlargement. And this is an echo picture, right peristernal lung axis, outflow tract view, left ventricle, Aorta, right ventricle, and a massively dilated right atrium in another example of another animal with tricuspid dysplasia. So atrial enlargement is the most important clinical risk factor that we can recognize easily. Treatment of atrial fibrillation. Sometimes it, it is considered to return back to sinus rhythm with a synchronized defibrillation. It's often not necessary in the, in the emergency setting. It can be done for lone fibrillation or for dogs which had a curable cause of heart disease. I've seen, for example, dogs with PDAs and atrial fibrillation, and after closure of the PDA, will fix the rhythm disturbance by defibrillation, going back to sinus rhythm. But most importantly, and in most cases of AFib, we try to control the frequency. So we're not curing the rhythm, we're just slowing down the ventricular response. And slowing down the ventricular response rate means increasing the refractory period of the AV node. So in fast AFib, when the heart rate in dogs is clearly above 150 beats per minute, treatment with either digoxin or diltiazem as a calcium channel blocker can slow down AV node conduction and increase the refractory period of the AV node Basically, it's called a negative dromotropic effect. And it slows down ventricular response rate, causing longer periods of diastole, better filling, and overall better cardiac function. And then the goal of treatment is to get the baseline heart rate in dogs below 140, 130 beats per minute. Second ECG. Have a look at this one collapsed two-year-old male neutered Labrador Retriever. So a very young dog. I hope you all agree the indication of this ECG must have been a severe tachycardia. This is a super, super fast rhythm. It's about three, four millimeters in between. So this is far over 300 beats per minute. 
might even be difficult to feel pulse in this dog. It must have been very weak, but of course there's no diastolic filling time. And we can see when we go to and discuss whether this is what a problem with impulse formation this is, this can't be a sinus tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia can't be this fast. And this extra bit here gives it away. This is a wider complex, but it's not a majority of complexes. So all these, all the other ones, are much, much faster. So this must be a supraventricular form of impulse formation, extra impulse formation. Um, you can see, by the way, here the seconds, so every second there are roughly four or five beats, so the heart rate's around 300. This is a very regular rhythm in contrast to atrial fibrillation uh, when this the supraventricular rhythm is this fast without any P waves, very regular. It's quite likely a macro re entry, a supraventricular tachycardia. Sometimes you can also see with focal atrial tachycardia. But this was a young Labrador retriever. They are prone to develop rhythm disturbances caused by macro re entry abnormalities like Wolf, Parkinson, White. Um, so it's a possible cardiac cause. Also, any systemic disease could cause a supraventricular tachycardia. So always one should consider extra cardiac causes like, like sepsis, um, uh, shock, um, quite broad possibilities. With regards to treatment, also with this, try if it's extra cardiac, try to treat the underlying cause. But if it's cardiac, the most important treatment is again to slow down the AV node conduction with diltiazem. Um, preferably injectable, but it's quite difficult to get diltiazem as an IV formulation in, in Australia. Um, so most often um, our emergency vets would use oral diltiazem, hourly titrating it up, hourly half a mic per kick per os, um, and hopefully that will break the initial rhythm. An alternative, if you really want to have um, quick results with IV, would uh, when IV diltiazem is not available, would be esmolol. Um, those ranges are here. Um, if it's effective, followed by a um, um, CRI infusion of 50 to 200 microgram per kilogram per minute. Um, these animals are notoriously difficult to stabilize for long term, so after stabilization, um, it's definitely recommended to discuss this and possibly refer such a case to a cardiologist for workup. And this dog had Wolf Parkinson White or autodromic AV reciprocating tachycardia, which can be ablated. Third example. Six-year-old male newt boxer collapsed. I think you all hopefully agree. The indication was a tachycardia. This is a very fast rhythm again. Um, it's about 300 beats per minute. No P waves. You look very carefully, you can see the baseline, and then you see a negative white complex followed by a positive deflection. This is a ventricular origin. Wide complex tachycardia, wide and bizarre complexes being negative and lead to, followed by a positive T wave. This is a very fast, sustained ventricular tachycardia. Very similar discussion with regards to causes can be cardiac, but also can be extra cardiac. Ventricular tachycardia can be co almost caused by any type of systemic disease. Um, notorious ones are. are, are, are anemia, hypoxemia, splenic tumors, um, systemic infections, um, but cardiac causes are also extremely relevant for ventriculate. Cardiac causes, um, this was a boxer, so one should really consider either dilated cardiomyopathy, as can be seen on this echo picture here, a white heart, almost no contractility, or a boxer's arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, Although with ARPC, most often the VPCs are upright in lead 2, and in this ECG, in this previous example, they were negative. But it could still be arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. It can also affect the left ventricle. 
um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, of course mainly a feline disease, but once in a while we do see it in dogs, and then more uncommonly endocarditis, myocarditis, and myocardial trauma. Those are all kind of cardiac causes of ventricular tachycardia in both dogs and cats. Extra cardiac causes already discussed, hypoxemia, anemia, many types of in intoxications, um, chocolate, digoxin, to name a few, GDV, splenic masses, systemic infections, many, many causes. You can see a picture here of a dog with congestive heart failure on the left, a dog with severe hemolytic anemia, turning completely enteric, also had massive feet disease, example of a dog that had to vomit due to an intoxication. Going to the treatment, there's absolutely no doubt that a collapsed animal needs treatment, but it's very important to realize that not each ventricular arrhythmia needs treatment. Basically, the main criteria for treatment are when it tachycardia is quite fast. Roughly, the guideline is heart rate above 180 beats per minute. When the tachycardia causes symptoms like collapse or weakness or weak pulse on physical examination, or when you see it in a breed with a high risk of sudden death. So if I would see a ventricular tachycardia and a Doberman, and the rate is only 160, and a dog's not clearly symptomatic, I quite likely would still treat it, because I assume the Doberman will have underlying DCM and might be at a risk of death from the DCM. The most important emergency drug for ventricular tachycardia is lidocaine. And the dose is over here. It's often not helpful to remember a lot of doses of, of, of drugs that we use in an emergency setting, but lidocaine is one of those drugs which is good to remember. Two milligram per kilogram, slow IV boluses, followed by a concentrated infusion. It's important to know that lidocaine, which is a um, sodium channel blocker, which is very effective for arrhythmias from, originated from the myocardium, in this case, the ventricular myocardium, it is mainly and mainly effective when serum potassium levels are normal or high normal. So, if lidocaine does not seem to work, it's always important to check for say, serum potassium levels and to correct them. And you know, subsequently, lidocaine will likely be effective. Ventricular premature complexes when it's not that fast. Um, so when the rate is less than 180, we often call it an idioventricular rhythm, or more accurately, an accelerated idioventricular rhythm, quite commonly seen with GDV, splenic tumors, dogs with systemic disease. Um, that does not always have to be treated. Again, only when it's fast, only when the clear symptoms. If it's, especially if it's extra cardiac, one has to treat the underlying cause. So the animal with anemia gets blood transfusion, if indicated. The animal with hypoxemia gets oxygen, if indicated, um, it's not necessarily always to give an antiarrhythmicum. Very common example is dogs with GDV. Of course, you'll treat the underlying cause, the dog goes to surgery. Often in the post-operative period, there are a lot of VPCs, but if the heart rate is not very fast, you don't have to treat it. Back ventricular flutter, so a very fast ventric ventricular rhythm. Um, if it's dead fast, in, the, in this flutter or over here might be a bit more irregular, but quite likely this is a motion artifact because we don't see it in lead three. If it's that fast, um, it's extremely important to realize that IV drugs are quite likely ineffect ineffective. Um, an injection of lidocaine will quite likely not sort effect. The treatment here should be defibrillation, so a shockwave, synchronous defibrillation, which is also a good treatment for lidocaine um, resistant ventricular arrhythmias. Fifth example, 12 year old cat. Cats normally have smaller complexes on the ECG, so everything is a bit more difficult to interpret. It might be quite hard to see P waves if you try to look for them. Indication. Hopefully you all see straight away this is a irregular heart rate. Um, starts off regular, but here two extra beats close close to each other. A compensatory pause. If you look very closely, you can see P waves. After these two abnormal ones, we see the first P wave. So this is sinus rhythm, followed by wide 
and bizarre complexes. Why? Because this is a bit wider than the QRS complexes. Bizarre because they're negative. T wave opposite to the large deflection. So these are couplets of VPCs. Sinus rhythm with couplets of VPCs. Over here is a fusion beat. Here, the period of by Gemini. Normal, abnormal, normal, abnormal, normal, abnormal, a by Gemini ventricular rhythm. So these are a few examples of relative B9 ventricular arrhythmias. Treatment is not always necessary if it's that, if it's that B9. A workup has to be done. Another example is a G number six. It was also a dog with um, an indication, a tachyarrhythmia. Uh, paper speed here is 25 millimeter per second. Over here is really fast. This is a heart rate of less than three, of more than 300, but sometimes it slows down. When looking at ECGs, we go towards the ECG diagnosis. It's always good to look through the whole strip straight away, and hopefully we can recognize that the third complex from the end, or the fourth complex from the end, is a sinus rhythm, sinus beat, P QRST, and this gives away um, the origin of the other um, complexes. This is a narrow complex. These are wide and bizarre. Although they're still positive and lead to, they are wide. Too wide with a T wave negative to the large deflections. So this sinus beat gives away, these are ventricular premature beats. So this is a non-sustained ventricular er, tachycardia. Quite long here, but then you see sinus rhythm for one beat. A couple of ventricular beats here, then two sinus beats couple of ventricular beats again, a non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. It's quite fast, so should likely be treated with lidocaine. If the ventricular arrhythmias are milder, so if you would consider oral medication um, or treating them in a longer course, of course, it's very important to treat the underlying cause like GDV, hypoxemia, already discussed. Uh, but if it has a cardiac origin, like HCM or DCM or ARVC, um, it's important to treat it with oral drugs. And it depends um, on the mechanism which drug is most effective. But the most, most effective drugs are either sodium channel blockers, like the lidocaine. A normal form of sodium channel blocker is maxillotine blocks the sodium channel, the inward sodium current during the start of depolarization. A uh, potassium channel blocker, like sotalol, so that it affects the repolarization, slows down the repolarization. Sotalol works on the potassium channel. Um, and also a tinolol can be quite effective. It basically slows down the whole conduction system. Um, in most dogs with ventricular arrhythmias like DCM, or ARPC, sotalol, and, and maxillotine are quite commonly used. In cats, I quite often can also use etinolol, but also sometimes sotalol. Okay, go to the seventh ECG. Five year old Dr. Bedeau with syncope. Paper speed is 25 millimeters per second. First question is, what's the indication of the ECG? As you can see, smaller complexes. Yeah. The frequency of roughly 150. We also can see larger complexes. There, there, there. At a frequency that's probably around 40 beats per minute. The smaller complexes are not associated with the larger complexes. There's a time here of, about, of, of a difference here of about 7 millimeters initially, over here it's 5 millimeters, over here it's 10 millimeters, over here it's 5 again, 10, 7, maybe only 2, so they're clearly dissociated from each other. These are the P waves, at a quite fast rate. And the other ones are ventricular escape beats. They're wide and bizarre. 
positive here, but two white, T wave negative to large deflection, these are ventricular escape beats. It's very important to realize that these are not ventricular premature complexes. These are ventricular escape beats. If this dog will be treated with lidocaine erroneously, this dog will quite likely pass away. These are ventricular escape beats that should be preserved as much as possible. Because there's no association between the P waves and the QRS complexes, the diagnosis here is a third degree AV block. Treatment should be pacemaker implantation. Third degree AV block is almost always caused by structural heart disease. Um, that should be worked up with, a, with an ultrasound of the heart, but almost always it is due to degeneration of the conduction system. Um, and in this syncopal dog, um, there's only one way to fix the wires of the heart, because basically the AV node is broken, and that's to rewire the heart with a pacemaker. And we can see so, still see P waves there, there, and there. This is a reasonably normal pacemaker rhythm. You should avoid any syncope in the future. Next ECG, five year old mixed breed dog. First of all, what's the indication? Again, we can see P waves. The frequency also of around 150 beats per minute. But not all P waves are followed by a QRS complex. Here it is. It's about four millimeters in between. Then two times not. Next one is also about four millimeters in between two times not, here it is, three times not, here it is, two times not, here it is followed, two times not, and here it is followed. There seems to be a clear association between the P wave and the QRS complex once the QRS complex is happening. It's at a predictable time after the P wave. But because not all P waves are followed by a QRS complex, we're dealing here, that's the ECG diagnosis with a second degree AV block. We've all going to discuss treatment. It's important with a second degree AV block to realize that it can be caused by structural heart disease, but also by an increased phagal tone. And that should be ruled out first. So the heart is beating faster when the sympathetic nervous system has a higher influence the heart is beating slow if the parasympathetic nervous system is having a high influence and that should be ruled out a high parasympathetic nervous system influence. That can be done with an injection of atropine at a, at a dose of 0.04 mg per kick, either subcutaneously IM or IV. Um, that should block the parasympathetic nervous system and if the second degree of feed block is caused by high parasympathetic tone, the rhythm should if you give it IV, within a minute, be a sinus tachycardia. If you give it subcutaneously, within 10 to 15 minutes, be a sinus tachycardia. In this example, there was a doxin with syncope. Before atropine, it was a second degree fee block. And after atropine, you can see the atropines in the body. The P waves are much more frequent. But still... Most of them are not followed by a QRS complex. So this is a sustained second degree fee block. In this case, after it's been concluded, it, the syncope is associated with structural heart disease and pacemaker implantation is indicated. This is an example of a uh, dog with brachycephalic obstruction syndrome, which also had a second degree fee block. P QRS T, P, P QRS T, P. And after atropine injection IV, the rhythm changed into a sinus tachycardia. So this, in this dog, the bradyarrhythmia was caused by a high phagal tone, was associated quite likely with the brachycephalic obstruction syndrome. So this dog did not need a pacemaker implantation, it needed airway surgery. Or we should consider other causes of a high parasympathetic tone, like neck pain, chronic respiratory disease of in another location, like pulmonary disease or chronic GI disease. If the second degree AV block is due to AV node disease, so the 
Rhythm is not responding to atropine pacemaker implantations indicated. Next ECG, quite a hard one. Eight-year-old cat. I think the indication is straightforward. It's easy. The cat's had a long period of what appears to be a flat line. So had problems with impulse formation at a block. Again, cats are quite hard. You have to look really carefully in the ECG. And there seems to be small waves in the middle. I'm trying to point them out with my mouse. There, there. So it seems that there are small P waves. But for a long time, there's no ventricular escape rhythm. The two ventricular escape beats here. And for a long time, the ventricles failing to have a stable escape rhythm. And here, two extra ones again. So this is a very, very severe third degree of feed block with an unstable escape focus of the ventricles. Quite concerning. Treatment, this cat had a pacemaker implantation as well. One of the last examples, lead two is a G of a five year male neutered cat with urethral obstruction. I think we all know that um, bradyarrhythmias can be due to heart disease. We discussed quite extensively um, in the previous slides, AV blocks. Um, also, an atrial standstill can be caused by structural heart disease, but atrial standstill can also be can also be secondary to hyperkalemia. If an, and the most common cause in cats will be urethral obstruction. The most common cause in dogs will quite likely be um, chronic kidney disease or acute kidney disease or Addison's disease. But all of those diseases. Um, either the urinary tract or endocrine can cause hyperkalemia and hyperkalemia is also giving an atrial standstill. What you will see in those cases is a loss of P-wave visibility. We don't see a clear P-wave anymore and the conduction in the ventricles becomes slower. You get a wider QRS complex with large tented T-waves. That rhythm is seen quite a slow um, ventricular rhythm one should always consider a secondary cause, a metabolic cause, i.e. hyperkalemia. Um, I'm not going to discuss in detail the treatment for this, but the, the treatment of underlying cause of urethral obstruction, um, but of course it has to be blocked. Hyperkalemia can be stabilized by infusions by in, with insulin. Um, the cell membrane can be um, stabilized with calcium injections. Um, um, all of those uh, possibilities are listed basically in, in this slide here. Um, if it's primary atrial stem cell, pacemaker therapy can be considered. If it's secondary to hyperkalemia, this is the list of treatment options. Often in the acute phase, if it's very severe, calcium gluconate IV is the immediate cardiac protection to make sure we don't get a, a complete um, cardiac arrest. Um, and then the correction of the hyperkalemia subsequently can be done with glucose, um, sodium bicarbonate, and insulin in the doses reported here. And of course, the underlying cause, like an urethral plug or Addison's disease, should be addressed. Okay, I think this is um, one of the last slides. Just um, it's a very busy slide discussing um, some principles of, of antiarrhythmic drug therapy. Um, most of the drugs have been discussed, most of the classes, uh, but in this figure on the left hand side, you can see a normal cardiac cell depolarization within phase zero, rapid depolarization towards a positive um, charge within the cell. The rapid rise is due to inflow of sodium in phase zero and one, then during phase two, you get rapid in inflow of calcium into the cell. Calcium causes excitation contraction coupling that gives a plateau phase of the action potential. And in phase three, which is a recovery phase, um, you get potassium flowing out of the cell. And in phase four, all the iron concentrations of sodium, calcium, and potassium are restored again. And each of these channels, the sodium channel, the calcium channel, and the potassium channel can be blocked. Um, sodium channel blockers are lidocaine and maxillotine. Lidocaine is the injectable form, maxillotine is the oral form. 
They're really effective for ventricular arrhythmias mainly. Um, potassium channel blockers um, are also quite effective for ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, the calcium channel blockers do mainly block the calcium channels in the um, specialized conduction system, mainly the AV nodes. They're quite effective for slowing down AV node conduction. So calcium channel blockers like diltiazem are often used for supraventricular arrhythmias. So that's it for this presentation. Um, I went through the most important ECGs in the emergency setting and discussed the most important details of how to treat those arrhythmias. Um, any questions, my email address is over here. Thank you.